Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Rabbi Stephen here. It's Rabbi Stephen. Yes, it is. Uh, all your feedback. Thank you. You prefer Stephen to Shmuel. Shmuel is a little over the top. That's okay. Like I said before, keep those cards and letters coming in. So, hope you've had a great week. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, ha, ha, Shabbat Hazeh. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, um, so it's a double portion this weekend. Thought I'd throw a little Hebrew at you. And the two portions, and you know, I've checked it out. Here's our calendar. And there you might be able to see it. I'm sure you can all read the Hebrew there. It is Matot Masai. And basically this brings the book of Numbers to a close. So we've got a couple of things, uh, a bunch of things actually happening here. Starts off talking about vows. Uh, but it talks specifically if a female, if a woman makes a vow. So this is a vow saying that I will pretty much deny myself of things. And uh, there are rabbis that look down on this. All right, They say, again, you've got 613 commandments to deal with. Why do you want to add more? And some people feel that they want to do that because they're very, very devoted. They want to go the extra mile. But this particular part of uh, this particular chapter, this particular part of the portion, really looks at if a woman makes a vow. And not just any woman. This is the wife of someone or a uh, nara, a, a youth, a young girl who's uh, below the age of, uh, around the age of 12 or 13, still living in her father's house. And the point of it is, is that if the man of the house, the father, hears the vow, and believes that, and that that vow is too much. The girl, the woman, does the young woman does not really understand uh, the consequences of taking that vow. He may annul it. Similarly, if a man uh, hears his woman make a vow, his woman, his wife make a vow, he can annul that as well. Also, they can also get what's known as a Beit Din. That it would be three knowledgeable Jewish adults over the age of 20 to sit as sort of an informal court and make that decision. So the question comes up, uh, and maybe people feel on the surface this is sexist. Why does the man get to decide whether or not the woman can annul the vow? Well, it's a good question. And really, in the Chumash, the two Chumash, actually the four Chumashim that I've read, uh, the Eitz Chaim, which is the latest version of conservative, the Sonsino edition, which is the classic, the one we a lot of us grew up with, uh, of the conservative. You've got the Art Scroll Masoro, which is the uh, Orthodox, and now you've got another Chumash from the Hasid. None of them seem to address that fact. <clears throat> so let me see if we can put a little bit of a spin on it. Now remember, in Judaism, women are seen as spiritually superior to men. So it really kind of is weird that a man who is less spiritually evolved than a woman can annul the vow, okay? But let's look at it this way. Women are very devoted. Women want to do more. They're very spiritual. They, that's why they keep the house. That's why they, they, they light the candles on Shabbat. So maybe the woman is, is caught up in, in in this, this feeling of devotion, of, of, of wanting to do something very special for Hashem. And maybe this is going to sound a little sexist, but women tend to be a little bit more emotional than men. Men are really more stoic, we're more uh, logical. So a woman just kind of maybe goes overboard, doesn't maybe realize what she's doing. The man hears this and says, ah, my wife is being very devoted, but she doesn't really understand uh, how, how intense this, this vow may be. So... I'm, I'm going to know it that way. I'm going to take the, the burden, the onus off it. So maybe it's kind of like a check and a balance, okay? Why doesn't a woman get to do that for a man? Well, we, we, men, need, we men need probably a lot more commandments than the woman. And, and that's really the case. Men are really more bound, bound to more commandments, especially the time-dependent the time uh, dependent ones like praying. So that's one possible explanation. As you delve into Torah and Talmud, you find that there's usually not just one, but two, three, four, five, maybe even six reasons why we do things. So that's it. The next thing that the uh, portion talks about is the raging war on the Midians, okay? The Midianites, the Moabites. These are the people that tried to, after they hired Balaam to curse the Israelites, it didn't work. They sent their daughters in to try and seduce the Israelites into immorality, into, and it didn't work. So Hashem is saying, these people mean nothing but harm. Go take them out. So Moses sends uh, Joshua. He sends Pinchas, who is now the uh, next in line to be the Kohen Gadol. But now he's what's known as the battle priest. You know, he's like like a chaplain. Keep bowing my head to show people that, yes, I'm wearing my amaga. Back there somewhere, right? Okay. 
um, they go off and they kill a lot of the men. They don't kill all the women, and Moses is really upset with some of the uh, the leaders of thousands, the leaders of hundreds, not uh, not the leaders of tens or or, or uh, whatever, but just those particular uh, leaders because he said, "Why didn't you take out the women too?" Those are the ones that seduced the Israelites. Now, there's some commentary that on the surface this seems real brutal. It almost seems like murder. Why would you kill all these people? Um, and it may seem a little too severe, especially today in our in our standards. But, you know, back then, there was no United Nations, whatever. There was no governing bodies. People just basically did what they wanted to do. So rather than have the Israelites that were still, you know, a little tentative in their beliefs, you know, be swayed by this immorality, by this idol worship, because remember, it wasn't just seducing them. It was seducing them in the context of idol worship. So they didn't want uh, Hashem uh, and Moses didn't want them to get caught up in that. So Moses says, no, you got to take out all of them because we don't want to make sure that that immorality lasts. Big question. Why didn't Moshe himself, Moshe Rabbeinu, participate in it? Because he felt that it was a Midianite. It was Yithro, who was his father-in-law, that really brought him in. And part of the part of the commentary is that, you know, how could Jethro, who was a Midianite chieftain, a Midianite priest, who was so devoted to Hashem, how come, how did it change? You know, why why now are the Midianites linking up and, and, and associating themselves with the Moabites uh, to engage in this immorality? Well, either there was a change of guard, change of leadership. Uh, they felt they were afraid. They needed to align themselves with the Moabites to protect themselves from this fake news, let's call it that, this alternative news that the Israelites meant them harm. Or maybe uh, Jethro was really another section of the Midianites that really wasn't associated with the mainstream Midianites. Okay, some thoughts. Next, we talk about uh, the, tri the, the travels of the Israelites over the last 38, 39 years. Now, we talk about the wanderings in the wilderness, right? And we get this impression, we get this picture of these people that are constantly on the march. Well, they really weren't. They really were not always on the march. In fact, it goes in and it talks about the different places where they camped. And what you find is that they camped 20 places in 38 years. That's approximately one place every couple of years. Not really a lot of traveling, okay? They stayed in one place, they used the resources, and they moved on until everybody over 20, 40 years ago had died out. And now there was a, a more hardy, uh, a, a, a better ready class of Sabra, that's what they call Israel, Israelis that are born in the desert, these Israelites, that did not know slavery, okay? They only know freedom. They're more, uh, more able, they're more, they have the mindset to go wage battle and take the land. So as they're moving their way, and they're kind of coming around, if you can imagine the Sinai Peninsula here, I know you're looking at me the other way, Sinai Peninsula here, present day Jordan is here, you've got the Sea of Reeds here, okay, and they're kind of coming around this way to go into the land roundabout. They're going through Moabite territory. Well, as they're doing that, taking out the Moabites, the tribes of Ruvain and God see that land and they say, wow, we've got cattle. We want a land for our cattle to graze and also where our children and our wives would feel good. Okay, so two things. First of all, they mentioned cattle. They mentioned sheep before they mentioned their wives and their sons. You know, kind of talked about their mindset, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of, of God. And they were kind of, and, and they say that because they had that mindset, they thought that their cattle, their means of livelihood was more important than their families. Um, when the ten tribes were conquered and dispersed, Reuben and God were the first to go. So Moses looks at him and says, okay, I need your promise that you're not just going to hang here and when we have to go into the land and take it, you're just going to stay here. And then they said, no, we, we, we will pledge our allegiance to you and our brothers and the other tribes. We will be there. Because what they're doing is they're sending in um, kind of like a special forces, you know, what they call, in one Chumash, they call them the shock troops. You know, these were commandos in a sense. Uh, and they say a thousand from each tribe, but it was more kind of balanced based on a proportion of a special team of warriors that would go in and wage a guerrilla war. They felt it was easier that way. So they pledged that they would still send men 20 years and older for that cause, okay? Moshe Rabino also went to the tribe of Menashe. And the tribe of Menashe saw this and they said, well, some of us want to stay here too, outside, you know, in what is now Jordan, outside the land, because we like it too. And Moshe basically said, okay, just would you keep an eye on the other tribes for us, okay? So that's basically what we have going on. 
um, that's basically uh, the, 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 the gist, the nature of these particular portions. And at the end, they also talk about inheritance. They now that the tribes are settling in the land, they're reviewing some of the uh, the commandments for how the uh, the uh, inheritance is apportioned. They also talk about the daughters of Slosfod, you know, who who were uh, wise enough to come up and and ask Moshe in all respect and Hashem in all respect. You know, we like our due as well. So that is our uh, double portion. We are now going into Devarim, which is uh, Deuteronomy. And uh, we'll talk about that next week. And we're coming to the end of the Torah. We're also coming into the high holidays. The high, the high holidays this year is at the end of September. Um, at B'nai Chaim, please join us. We're looking forward to gathering you all together and, and praying that we have a, uh, a good year for next year. And, and Hashem writes us in the Book of Life. So thank you again for listening. And may you have a, a great Shabbat. And you know, do, do something to observe Shabbat, folks. I know, I know, a lot of you, most of you, all of you, are not Shomer Shabbat. And, you know, but but do something on a Friday night or Saturday. Just do something to connect with Hashem. Do it for you, okay? Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much.